set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee israel strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art dear desire of every nation joy Yeah. 
announcements this morning, so I hope you will bear with me. The announcement is there are, uh, uh, if you are interested in the offering envelopes, number one, if you are getting offering envelopes and using them and you want to continue, you're fine. If you are, have offering envelopes and don't want to continue, you need to see Dick, Dick Westfall. By the way, Dick, welcome back. We're glad you are here. And then if you don't have offering envelopes and would like to have offering envelopes, you need to see Dick Westfall. So take care of that. That's that set of notes. Thank you note here. Uh, thank you. Your kindness may seem simple to you, but it meant everything to me.
thanks again, and this is to the entire church family, for the prayers and the phone calls and cards. Once again, we thank you, loving Christ, for the lo uh, loss of Jim and Lynn and loved ones. And uh, continue to pray for uh, Jim and Lynn in the loss of Lynn's brother and nephew. Um, uh, if you'd like to contribute to the church Christmas gift for Pastor Doug and Amy, you need to clearly mark that in one of the brown envelopes. If you run out of brown envelopes, go grab one from somebody else. I mean, another location. Uh, and uh, then clearly mark it, place it in the envelope uh, this Sunday uh, or next. Uh, we'll make sure that they get all those funds. Uh, I did want to share a couple of things with you. Uh, these were from last week, so there's some carryover, but hopefully uh, you will continue to be praying for our church family. Uh, I know that for the last couple of weeks, Dick and Sandy, and Dick and Sandy are here, praise God, and uh, they've been dealing with some winter illnesses, and so uh, be praying for them, continued healing there. Uh, again, a reminder, continue to pray for Lynn. Uh, she has had a rough uh, a couple of weeks, and so just praying for her and the loss of her brother and then uh, of her nephew. Uh, be praying for Butch as he is traveling and uh, in the passing of his mother, and I believe he is in Oregon right now, is that correct? And, uh, and then be praying for his father's salvation. Uh, Butch indicated that perhaps he's getting, his father's getting closer to that point, so continue to pray for that. Uh, also be praying for Barry as he starts radiation uh, treatment, and uh, uh, a, a little bit of uh, trial and testing there, so continue to pray for Barry. And then my last one in here is it's sort of an answered prayer, sort of, is Dick Westfall for his re recuperation and his eye infection. And again, we're glad to have him back here uh, with us this morning. Some other announcements this Tuesday. Typically, there would have been a uh, ladies' Bible. I'm sorry, Dick. Yeah, okay. I'll, uh, yes, thank you. That's one of them. I knew there was another one I needed to jot down. I uh, received word on uh, Thursday, whenever Caroline called me, that Naomi had fallen on Tuesday and was in the hospital. I think she is still there. Her daughter, Barb, came up and was with her uh, yes, day before yesterday. Is that correct? Was with her. Her daughter went home and tested positive for COVID. Uh, Naomi is having a very difficult time. And so continue to pray for Naomi, pray for her daughter Barb, and uh, all that goes on there. Barb also put up on Naomi's Facebook page that because she has COVID, she can't go visit her mom. So if any of you are able to go and visit, she provided a phone number that you can use and just call her and let her know how her mom is doing. She would appreciate that. If you don't have EBC Impact and you want that phone number, I believe my wife has it. Uh, no ladies Bible study. Uh, thank you, Dick, for reminding me of that. Uh, no ladies Bible study this Tuesday. The only services going on are the adult, teen, and children's ministries at 6.30. And, uh, and those are the regular scheduled uh, meetings. Uh, this Saturday, we are going to have a Christmas Eve service, uh, 6.30 in the evening. And it will be a time when we can sing some Christmas carols, reflect on the reason for the season. It will not be a long service, but uh, we would like to invite you all to be a part of that. Uh, next Sunday is our Chris obviously Christmas, and we'd like to encourage you to invite friends and neighbors to join us. We're going to have a special service. It will not be a long, prolonged service. We'll do uh, quite a number of Christmas carols and a, and a brief message. Uh, I think brief message, Pastor Doug? Never mind. Oh, always brief, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, let's see, uh, call to prayer, December 31st, last day of the year. Uh, there is a uh, call, per, call to prayer, breakfast and prayer opportunity, and it's during that time there will be a breakfast serve. So it runs from 9 o'clock in the morning till noon. That's what you should schedule, plan out. Uh, breakfast will be at 9, and the prayer will start around 10.30. So if you can't make it for breakfast, you're one of those uh, sleeper inners. You can get here at 1030 and join in the prayer. Um, praying for our, our state, our country, and for little churches in this community that we can have an impact in the days to come and in the new year. Scripture reading this morning is a little bit different. I wanted to uh, do this as a preface as we move toward Christmas. Luke chapter 1 and verses 26 through 38 gives us the backstory story of, of the Christmas story. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a, ci a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, 
And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be the great, he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. A great leading into the Christmas story as we realize that uh, we celebrate Christ's coming incarnation uh, here on earth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this time of the year when we can celebrate and focus upon your gift to us, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that he willingly left that throne room to be here, limited by humanness and yet full of a deity. We don't understand how that all took place, but we do understand that it was your plan and that you desire to communicate to us your love. We thank you that Jesus came full well knowing what was laying before him, born as a baby, helpless, alone, and yet able to know and realize that he would provide salvation for an entire world. We thank you, Father, for that. We thank you for thinking of us. We thank you for that we have the opportunity, especially this season, to share that message, the hope that we have, the joy that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ. May we not consider it a little thing, but realize that we have the great, greatest hope that anyone can ever have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That we can have the greatest joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you would be uh, honored as we share your message to a lost and dying world. We realize that we live in a very dark time. We live in a very dark community. And so we pray that you would give us wisdom and courage as we share uh, that message this season. May we not limit it to this season, but may we be ready and willing to give a reason for the hope that is within us. Father, we thank you for those who are uh, a part of our ministry team around the world. We think of our missionaries, and so many of them are communicating at this point in time, and we realize that there are many things going on in their lives. May we continue to be praying and upholding them in prayer. We thank you for the opportunity we have of being able to support them financially. But I realize that the most important part that we can play is in praying for them faithfully. We realize that they face the same, some, of the face, uh, some of the same situations that we face. Uh, sometimes I'm sure that they are lonely and feel left alone uh, away from family and friends. And other times they may be facing uh, difficult times. I pray that you would give them courage and wisdom and strength. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have of, of upholding those who are part of our immediate family. We thank you for bringing Dick back to us and for watching over him. We just pray that you would continue to work in his heart and his life, continue to help him as he uh, recuperates, and uh, we would pray that we would be encouragers of him on a daily basis. We think of Lynn and Jim and for the situation and the difficult times that they have faced in just the last few weeks. And just pray, again, that you would encourage them. May they find their hope in you. And may we be, again, faithful to pray. We think now especially of Naomi, one who has been a part of this church family longer than any of us here. And we realize that uh, she is in discomfort. We pray that you would comfort her. May she sense your presence and peace. Lord, we pray that you would accomplish your will in her heart and in her life. Pray that as, as uh, the situation unfolds, that her daughter will be able to uh, get past the COVID and be able to visit with her mom. And perhaps, as a result of this time, understand more fully uh, your plan for her life. Thank you, Father, for watching over each of us. Help us as we celebrate this Christmas season to be safe, to be rejoicing in you, and we thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have of gathering here together to hear your word. Help us to be hearers, not just hearers, but doers of your word. I pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, that we would hear the message that you have for each one of us. May we not assume that the message is for someone else, but that it is for me. And that you desire to communicate your love, your, 
instructions through your word. Again, Father, we want you to receive the honor and glory. Do your name as a result of our time here. So we ask for your continued blessing as we sing, as we listen to your word, and as we fellowship. And we'll give you the honor and glory for it. And thank you in Christ's name. Amen.
Good morning. Uh, exciting, right? Uh, we have Christmas coming up. It's probably my favorite holiday. Uh, you know, I like Thanksgiving a lot too because you know, you get to eat food. You know, so but Christmas, you know, Christmas is is the best. Uh, the ideas of you know giving and receiving, uh, and just the idea of of Christ coming and being the the greatest gift of all. So. Uh, one of the reasons I had picked Isaiah is because of all the, uh, uh, just the prophecies of Christ that Isaiah talks about. And it's such a beautiful image of the Messiah to come and the hope of the Messiah. <clears throat> and so uh, we're going to be in Isaiah uh, chapter 41. We're going to start in 41. Uh, John had told me about how much he loves, uh, how much I jump around in the uh, book of Isaiah. But I don't have time to uh, go over all 66 chapters or else I would, uh, but it's, it's such a great book. But Isaiah chapter 41, if you uh, brought your Bibles with you today. Again, the theme is the Holy One of Israel. He will judge, uh, he will restore, and he's going to save his people. He's the only one that can. Uh, actually, I lied to you, Isaiah 40. Actually, I'm going to read Isaiah 40, uh, 31, kind of as a recap, um, but then we're going to get into uh, Isaiah 41. It says, yet those who hoped in Yahweh will gain new power. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And we had already kind of talked about this. Last week we had considered the goodness of God uh, and how he provided for his people. He's the only one that is able to. Uh, we read about, uh, we've talked about how the, the kings of Israel, uh, even though some did some things that were good and many of them did things that were terrible and, and uh, they were leading the people in in ways of sin. So we read chapter 40 last week in Isaiah, well actually two weeks ago, I'm sorry, we didn't have church last week. Our beautiful artist of an author, Isaiah, he's painting us this picture of God's overwhelming love that he has for his children. Um, but we also read about how uh, his children do not want to love and obey their, their God, their heavenly Father. So we last read this uh, most famous and most favored verse, uh, Isaiah 40, chapter 31. Um, and again, yet those who hope in Yahweh will, will gain new power. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run, not get tired. Um, they will walk, and they will not become weary. And so we understand that those that rely on the Lord, they will have this supernatural strength. They will have this supernatural power that comes from their relationship with God. And it only can come from their relationship with God. It's only those who know God, who cherish their relationship that God is able to give this power and this strength to. It's to no one else. We can have confidence in our lives, uh, and the Israelites were supposed to have confidence in their lives to go forth and to do the, uh, the will of God and to preach the word of God. And they were, in fact, supposed to do that to the entire world. So we re uh, then we read from Romans uh, 8.31, which tells us, What then shall we uh, then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us. So it's with this idea that then we enter chapter 41. And it's interesting because we're going to see a little bit of a contrast here uh, and kind of where Isaiah goes to. We're actually going to end in, if I can get there in time, uh, we're going to end in chapter 53, I believe. And uh, we're going to see uh, how God is going to bring about his people to chapter 65, which is that perfect heavenly city. And so in Isaiah 41, starting in verse 1, it says, Coastlands, listen to me in silence, and let the peoples gain new power. Let them come forward, let them speak. Let us draw near together for judgment. Who has awakened one from the east, whom he calls in righteousness to his feet? He gives, us, or he gives up nations before him, and he has dominion over kings. He makes them like dust with his sword, as the wind-driven chaff with his bow. He pursues them, passing on in peace, by a way he had not come with his feet. Who has worked and done it, calling forth the generation from the beginning? I, Yahweh, am the first, and with the last, I am he. The coastlands have seen and are afraid, the ends of the earth, they tremble. They have drawn near and have come. Each one helps his neighbor and says to his brother, 
be strong. So the craftsman strengthens the smelter, and he who smooths metal with the hammer strengthens him who beats the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, and he strengthens it with nails so that it will not be shaken. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, seed of Abraham, my friend. I'm going to pause here real quick and explain what's going on. Isaiah writes, is writing about the majesty of God. He writes about how God is the only one that is in control of the world. He has perfect and complete dominion over what's going on. God's the only one that's actually doing and creating the work that he wants to have accomplished. It's not man. It's not man's dominion. It's not what man can do. It's God and what God is doing and has done. God has dominion over kings. He makes them like dust with a sword if he chooses to. As the wind is driven with chaff, he does so with his bow if he chooses to. Then we see in verse 8 that Israel has been chosen to be the servant of God, to be the servant of their king. What a most holy, what a most awesome honor it is to serve the king of the universe. Yet for so long, Israel has forgotten that. They've forgotten who they are, who they're supposed to be, and who they're called to be. This is the picture that Isaiah is painting for Israel, who they're supposed to be. Don't you understand the God that you serve? Don't you understand the position that you've been put in by God? And so just as, this is just as important for us today to understand what Isaiah was saying to the Israelites because this is the message for us now. Isaiah lived in a world where his people wanted to serve the creation more than they served the creator. Is this not similar to what's been going on today? Do we not live in a world that wants to save the planet yet is still willing to kill innocent children before they're even born? Do you think that our world is much different than that of Isaiah's? I honestly don't think so. There's nothing new under the sun. That's what the scriptures tell us. This is what Isaiah is kind of leading us towards. But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, seed of Abraham, my friend. For God to call someone friend, isn't that an amazing thing? Why was Abraham called the friend of God? Because of his faith, because of his belief, because he acted upon his faith. And when action comes from faith and belief, good things happen, right? Abraham was offering up Isaac. This all happens after Abraham was offering up Isaac. And the angel of the Lord came down and said, no, no, no. We understand now that you have faith. And God knew that. But it was a trying of, of Abraham's faith, not for God, but for Abraham. And so Abraham would tell his son, and then Abraham's son would tell his son, and then Abraham's son would uh, or uh, then his son will tell his son, and his son will tell his son. And it goes on and on because this act of faith. And then it's even written thousands of years later uh, by other men in the New Testament. Remember when God called Abraham his friend because of faith in God. Don't forget who you're supposed to be. You are supposed to be the friend of God. He calls you friend. And now as Christ is our Savior, he calls us brother. He calls us sister. He calls us his, his wife, his bride, to love us that much. Do we forget who we are? Isaiah says, don't forget this is who you are. Verse 9 uh, in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. God knows, God sees, God understands. Ecclesiastes 1.10, is there anything of which one might say, see this, it's new? Already it's been for ages, which were before us. Why is this important to Isaiah? I find that we must understand how to relate to a man literally writing to a people uh, almost 13 or 3,000 years ago, about 2,700 years. This can be difficult, difficult because our world seems so vastly different. And in many ways, it is. Technology is much different. Uh, I was talking with someone how, uh, you know, back in Paul's time, uh, actually, I was uh, talking about it on Thursday about, uh, with, uh, in uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. 
Uh, he was talking about how he was worried about Titus. Well, Titus didn't have a cell phone. Uh, Titus didn't have an email. <sighs> you know? So he couldn't, he couldn't get a hold of Titus, and he says he's worried. He was worried about Titus. Right? That's what Paul says. And so the world that we live in is, is, is very different in many ways uh, when we consider technology and, and what we're able to, to do. But sin is not different. The heart of men, it's not different. It's the same heart, the same sin, the same mental things and struggles that the Israelites went through is what we go through. That's not different. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so he's dealt with all these things that we deal with in our lives. That's why we put our faith and our trust in him, because he knows how to deal with it. He's been dealing with it for thousands of years. Because there's been thousands and millions of crazy people like you and I. So he knows how to deal with us, which is great to know. That also means, though, that our adversary, the devil, Satan himself, is also the same as he was yesterday, as he is today, as he will be tomorrow. He hates you. He hates me. He hates the world. He hates that man was created in the image of God, and he wants man's ultimate destruction. That's his goal. That's what he was trying to do with Adam and Eve. He was trying to kill them. He says, do you believe that you'll surely die? I don't think Satan knew whether or not they were actually going to die, but he was probably hoping they would. And so he leads them to sin. He leads us to sin. Satan doesn't have new tricks. He might use new technologies, but he has no new tricks. He knows the weaknesses of mankind. He knows what will get you to stumble. He knows what will get me to stumble. He knows how we'll sway away from God and His Word. One of the most famous Old Testament false gods is the Old Testament god uh, named Baal. One thing that was required for the worship of Baal was child sacrifice. Anytime you see in the Old Testament a nation that's worshiping Baal, you can know that that nation is literally sacrificing their own children to Baal. And so when you read about the Israelites worshiping Baal, what do you think they were doing? Why do you think this was so upsetting to God? Another famous uh, goddess was, uh, was one called Ashereth, Ashtaroth, or Ashtaroth, it's spelled differently, but uh, anytime you see the Asher is usually the same goddess. She was the goddess of fertility and love. In order to worship her, you were required to do uh, pagan rituals in the temple, which usually required you to have sex with temple workers and slaves. So now you have a people worshiping Asherah, or Asherah, by having outside of the marriage sex. So now you have women getting pregnant with unwanted babies to then sacrifice these babies on the ultimate, uh, most vile, false god, Baal's altar. This is the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? You have the goddess Diana, goddess of sex and virginity. Same way to worship Asherah. Asherah. Same way women are getting pregnant in the temples as people are worshiping uh, Diana. And so it is uh, a well-known fact that there are tons of animal sacrifices for Zeus, the big Greek god, right? And they said, well, there was no human sacrifices uh, to Zeus, but that is not the case. They have found human remains among the animal sacrifices. I mean, when we're talking about these sacrifices, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of bones that they're ciphering through, and they have found human remains. Well, who do you think they were sacrificing? except for unwanted children because most of the bones that they find that are human are small. So that brings us today. We may not say that we are worshiping the God of Zeus or Baal. We may not say that we're worshiping the goddess of Diana or Asherah, but are we not still sacrificing our babies? 
And we don't even let them exit the womb before we do this. And one of the worst things that I've ever heard is that they actually use the remains for health care, especially in beauty products for women today. Are we still not worshiping Baal and Zeus and Diana and Asherah in our world today? And we ask, why is there evil? Why do terrible things happen? It's because Satan hates you and I. Our flesh is driving us towards sin. And the church is not stepping up and speaking out, remembering our position in heaven next to our God, seated at the right hand with Jesus Christ himself. Can you not see how Isaiah is dealing with the same Israel 2,700 years ago compared to the world that we are now dealing with today? You and I are called to be Isaiah. You and I are called to be the friends of God, like Abraham, speaking out, like Noah, That's why these examples are given to the Israelites and now are given to you and I. Because they lived by faith, not just by sight. They honored and understood who their God was. And so it was by that they lived by faith. Isaiah 41.9, bringing us back to Isaiah. You whom I have strongly taken hold of from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be anxious. Look about you, for I am your God. I will make you mighty. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Pausing there, who sits at the right hand of the throne of God now? Jesus Christ. Who does he uphold us with? Jesus Christ. I think that's a beautiful image. Verse 11, Behold, all those who are angered at you will be shamed. They will be dishonored. Those who contend with you will be as nothing. They will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you. You're not going to find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing, non-existent. For I am Yahweh, your God who strongly takes hold of your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. This is an image, a precursor of chapter 65. Remember, we're trying to get there. Isaiah paints the dark, the bleak, and then he shows us the light. Because the world we live in is dark, but we have a light, Jesus Christ. So God tells the Israelites through Isaiah, to not have any fear. Don't be anxious. Don't be scared. It says, He is with them. This is the same promise to you and I. It's not different. There's no one to fear because God is going to remove anyone that will want to fight with Israel. God's going to remove anything in front of us that's going to want to withstand us from moving forward with God's will. <coughs> Excuse me. So we take this promise that God has given to the Israelites, but we can take this promise to the bank as children of God. God will uphold us. He will take care of us. We are not to love God's creation more than we love God. We are not to focus on what we can gain more than our relationship and what we can achieve here on earth for God, for heaven, for heaven's sake. When our gaze leaves that of Jesus Christ, We become like the Israelites that Isaiah was preaching to. We become like Peter, and then we start to sink in the water because we've left our sight on Christ. And so then we we enter chapter 42. I'll skip a few verses. We're going to go to uh, verse 6. Isaiah writes that God says, I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will also take hold of you by the hand of and guard you. And I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. To open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and those who inhabit darkness from the prison. Pause. God says that Israel, his people, are to be a covenant, 
to the people, all people, a light to the nations, a light to open the eyes of the blind, to set prisoners free. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like someone that's going to come and do these things? It's an image of Christ. Moving on, verse, uh, skipping down to verse 6, or going to, sorry, going to Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So it's a few verses later, uh, a few, you know, a few books later. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. This is Jesus Christ. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus. He opened the scroll. He found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and recover of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is the scripture that Jesus goes to to read, but he doesn't read it as if he's, he's reading Isaiah's words. He reads it as if it's his word, which it is. Because the fun thing is, is that Jesus is the one that told Isaiah to write things. So when he reads it, oh, they understand that he's reading it with authority, and he means this. Jesus is the Messiah who fulfills the prophecies that Isaiah has written about. Jesus is this perfect light of the world who has set the captives free and has given the sight to the blind. Who are the captives and who are the blind, if not you and I, or you and me? Isaiah 42, verse 18, it says, Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or so deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is so blind as if, or as he that is at peace with it, with me, or so blind as the servant of Yahweh? Verse twenty. You have seen many things, but do not do. Not do uh, you do not keep them. Your ears are open, but none hear. Yahweh was pleased for his righteousness' sake, that he make the law great and majestic. But this is a people plundered and pillaged as spoil. All of them are trapped in caves or are hidden away in prisons. They have become a plunder with none to deliver them, a spoil with none to say, have them return. Isaiah has been, in his warning, the Israelites of the coming exile in Babylon. God saved them from the hand of Assyria, even though Assyria was the power at the time. But Isaiah has already warned them. He's actually even told them who's going to come in and conquer them. He's told them the king of of Babylon that will do this. This is why deliverance from these evil people, it's not enough. The problem is not an external suppressor. It's the heart of the people. The problem is is on the inside, not on the outside. The problem is the the heart of Israel. What's the problem today? The heart of people. The Israelites were in shambles because of their lack of faith and because of their worship of these false gods. They had no trust in God. They had no faith in God. And so we have heard of His promise of salvation that God would eventually bring a Messiah to save his nation. But the promise goes beyond that because it's also a promise to the world. So this is going to lead us to, uh, we're going to jump down to chapter 49. Um, I'm going to try to get through a little bit of chapters uh, in 50, Isaiah 50, but chapter 49. Isaiah is going to take us from the physical to the spiritual. There's an idea and a promise that God is going to crush his servant because of the lack of faith of his people. This doesn't sound like a positive thing or a good thing. However, remember how Isaiah loves to present the dark and then the light. 
So we turn to Isaiah 49, and I want you to remember, or I want you to think of these two questions. Who is the servant, and what does the servant do? Isaiah 49, starting in in verse 5. So now says Yahweh, who formed me from the womb to be his servant? To return Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am glorified in the sight of Yahweh, and my God is my strength. He says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant. To raise up the tribes of of Jacob and to cause the preserved ones of Israel to return. I will also give you as a light of the nations. So that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Pause. Isaiah is talking about God's servant who will bring Israel, God's people, back to himself. So then, who is this servant? Who is this individual? It's not a group of people. right? It's not the servants. I love uh, the LSB because it actually capitalized servant in these verses because the servant is, of course, Jesus Christ. And I love the fact that it's not a light just for Israel. This is one thing that the Israelites have missed. It's what the Jews continually miss. Is that they were meant, the servant that was coming, was meant to be a light to all nations. Which means all people. Verse 7. Thus says Yahweh, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One. To the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see and arise. Princes will also bow down. Because of Yahweh, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Thus says Yahweh, in an acceptable time I have answered you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you, and I will guard you and give you for a covenant of the people, to establish the land to make them inherit the desolate inheritance, saying to those who are bound, go forth, to those who are in darkness, show yourselves, along the roads they will feed, and their pasture will will be on all bare heights. So it is a servant that brings God's people back to God, but this individual will also complete all the requirements that God had called his people to accomplish. The requirements that they had failed to accomplish while they were here. A true and a faithful Israelite will do these things. He will be God's perfect, holy servant. And so we're going to skip down to Isaiah 52, 13. Sorry if you feel like I'm rushing. I am a little bit close to my time. But Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high. He will be lifted up. He will be greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. Jesus is going to be high and lifted up. This same image is, what, or is when he was before God uh, in the temple. Right? This is the same image that we see uh, Christ So he is God's king, yet he will be marred. He will be so unattractive. It will be awful to look upon him. More than any other man, this is the image we get of Christ, the perfect and holy servant. This will be what he looks like. Kings will be speechless to speak. Skipping down to ver- or chapter 31, or 53, sorry, Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of the parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. He was despised, he was forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, 
and we did not esteem him. He is God's arm. He is God's strength. No one took him for that. He was ordinary. He was birthed. He had a childhood like everyone else. He was not seen to be fit as a king. And yet, and so he was despised and he was rejected. Nothing special about him. Verse 4, surely our griefs he himself bore. Our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God. He was afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The The chastening for our peace fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Isaiah is expressing a great exchange has taken place in this servant's rejection. He gets what we deserve, and we get what he's earned. How is that just? How is that fair? Verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? That for the transgression of my people, striking was due to him. So his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence nor was there any deceit in his mouth. This servant, which committed no crimes, he will be killed for the sins, the iniquities of others. This servant will be wounded for our transgressions. He will be wounded for the transgressions of others, and it is by his wounds that those others that he died for, that they will be healed and they will be saved. We see a lot of similar, similar language uh, that was seen at the beginning of Isaiah in chapter 6 when we first started. Isaiah's message has been the same. God hates iniquity. He hates sin. There must be a punishment for sin, for iniquity. God will punish sin by cutting off his people from the land of the living. That's hell. That's death. God, however, will restore his people Do you not find it interesting that the things that God promised to do to Israel because of their sin is actually what he does to his servant? Do you not find it odd or even wrong that the punishment that God had planned for his people is now cast upon his humble and perfect servant? Where is the justice if the innocent is killed and the guilty are freed? Verse 10, and I'm almost done. Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If you would place his soul as a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will succeed in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge of, uh, the, by the, his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant, he will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide for him a portion with the many. He will divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death. And as was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. The righteous for the unrighteous. The perfect for the imperfect. How can anyone believe that this is right? that this is just. There's not a single one of us that would allow this to happen if we were the judge. We would never say, yes, this is right. This is what needs to happen. 
We would never let the proven guilty go free. And we would never let the proven innocent be killed. Yet God, God, in His perfect knowledge and wisdom, was pleased to crush His servant as a perfect guilt offering. The righteous one will justify many. He will bear the iniquities so that you and I do not have to. So then the question is, why? Why would God do this? Because this was the only way that God was going to get to chapter 65. It's the only way that we are going to see a perfect, holy, precious city that God had promised. There is no other way. There's nothing by human intent that we could do, that anyone in the past could do, to bring us to God, to glorify God. Because what was the ultimate aim of Jesus Christ? The glory of His Father. And His Father said, I want chapter 65. I want the perfect and holy city for my people. Christ came and said, yes, sir. Here I am, send me. Jesus Christ is, of course, His perfect servant that is going to come and accomplish the will of God. And it is through Christ that we can inherit the perfect city that Isaiah writes about in chapter 65. And so that is what we see as the children of God now. If you have put your faith and your hope in Christ, we have the perfect city because of what Isaiah was talking about, Christ coming. And so as we see the death of Christ was the reason for his birth, and so he was born to die. And so as Christmas comes, and we're out buying our last-minute gifts for our friends and our families. Remember that the perfect gift, the most holy servant, was given. It's the reason why we give presents today. And so my challenge is, don't give a present to someone without telling them about Jesus. Don't give a gift to someone that isn't the most holy and precious, perfect gift of Jesus Christ. Because if they don't know Christ, All the gifts that you give them are going to stay here and they're going to go to hell. Pray for the souls of your loved ones. This is one of the best times to witness to people that don't know Jesus. Isaiah says we live amongst evil and imperfect people. He says you're going to go through hell on earth because of your lack of faith. Let's not be like the Israelites. Let's have faith in our God, understanding what He's done, how He sent His Son. You and I wouldn't send our children. Which one of us would say, I'm going to sacrifice my son? I couldn't do it. I'll tell you right now, there's no, I couldn't do it. I could not look at my son and say, you're going to die for these people. But that's what God did for you and I. Every time I think about it, I just think about how much love our Father has for us. Yet we live in a world where people don't care. And I ask why. It's because we need to tell them. We need to tell them about how much love God has for us. And if we would be that people, couldn't we start saving the children in the womb before they're sacrificed to Baal and to Zeus and to whatever God we have today? Let us be the people of God that love Him more than we love ourselves and that will tell the world about how much Jesus loves them. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for these words from Isaiah. Thank you for your love for us, Father God. Thank you for sending your son to be birthed, to die, to take our iniquities, to take our sin, to suffer the anguish and pain that we deserve for eternity. Father, please don't let us take this for granted, especially during this season. Remembering your son's birth, help us to be people that give the gift, the perfect and gracious and great gift of your son and the great news of salvation which has come to all people. Let us be the light in this ever-darkening world. Thank you for choosing us and for using us and saying to us, you are my beloved, you are my friend, my brother, my sister. 
my spouse. Thank you for calling us your wife as your church, Lord. We ask that we would honor you as such. Thank you for upholding this church for over 100 years, Lord. Thank you for the many servants that you have built up uh, by your most holy, precious servant's hand. Thank you for the service that so many of these, uh, these people are able uh, and willing to do for you and to show love towards each other. Help that love that we show towards each other spread to the community around us, Father God. Let us be a light uh, in Gloversville and Fulton, Montgomery County, Father God. We are your people here to be used by you for your purposes. And Lord, so we ask you now, use us. Let us be people of your book, understanding your words and your ways. People that love to pray, to come before you and talk to our God, that we would be able to come boldly speaking to you, understanding what you'd have accomplished. And let us fellowship strongly and mightily, Father God, looking to encourage each other in your words through Scripture, Father God. Thank you for the books that you are allowing us to read freely here in the United States, the books of your Bible. And thank you for the faithful men that have lived before us, the faithful women that have lived before us, that are great example, examples for us to live by. Help us to live by them, Father God, by the faith uh, that you have stored in us. We love you. We thank you. We ask all these things in your Son's holy and precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the perfect Savior. Amen.